It's now my great pleasure to introduce our next panel for the day. So if I can invite you all to come up, we've got Catherine Murphy from The Guardian who will be facilitating this panel session on leading for inclusion. And if I can also invite Kirsty Skye and Troy to the stage. Unfortunately, Tracy Hayes has sent her apologies. She wishes that she could be here and sends her regards to everybody. So today's panel will, um, a bit of a background is some of Australia's most respected leaders, this is these guys here, will share their insights on how championing inclusion in their workplaces has delivered benefits not only socially but also for the economics and the broader um, whole thing of their organisation. So please join me in welcoming this panel. Thanks very much to Kath, that's great. And can I just say, uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here at this Congress and uh, also uh, to be chairing this fantastic panel with these great people. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Catherine Murphy. I'm political editor of Guardian Australia. And now I'm going to uh, let my panel introduce themselves as well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. My name is Kirsty Richards. I work for Sunpork Farms. I'm actually a veterinarian by trade. Um, but I'm here today representing the Autism and Agriculture program that Sunpok runs um, and that I'm leading up. Fantastic. Hello, I'm uh, Troy Setter. I'm part of the team at uh, Consolidated Pastoral Company or, or CPC and uh, we really value the diversity in our business and, uh, and continue to want to grow the diversity in our business because it's been great for you know, the business both socially and economically. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name's Dr Sky Saunders. I work at the Australian National University um, as a Gender and Law uh, Associate Professor. Um, I have a particular passion and interest um, in researching issues of uh, gender as they pertain to the rural space. And so that's um, the capacity that I'm really pleased to join you to talk about today. Just before I kick off with some questions to our panellists, I'm just uh, just putting a reminder out there that uh, the best thing about doing these panels is hearing questions from the floor. So uh, I know there'll be a lot of uh, questions and interests around uh, some of the issues we raise, so I'm just sort of sending out a general alert for people to get their thinking caps on. Uh, so uh, I, w I want to start with uh, my two business uh, folks here because obviously the, the session title is Leading for Inclusion. So I want to hear a little bit about what's happening in their businesses specifically in order to lead for inclusion. <laughs> tell us, so I'll, tell I'll start about, up with... Tell um, me about your fantastic program. <laughs> um, so a little bit of background about Sunport for those who aren't aware. Um, we uh, have 47 farms across Australia and New Zealand. We also run two abattoirs um, and two value-add facilities, um, broadly based across Queensland and South Australia with um, a few sites in New Zealand and New South Wales. Um, about two and a half years ago now, we embarked on an endeavour to uh, take advantage of an untapped uh, human resource, and that is the autistic community. Um, autism is present in approximately 1 to 2 per cent of the general population, so um, it's a significant untapped uh, population out there. They're just as prevalent in uh, rural communities, um, and we were as a business challenged, I, I heard it spoken about at the previous uh, panel, we've always had challenges finding not only labour, but skilled labour, um, and we struggle with a drain um, to other industry. So we, um, together with the Autism CRC, Pork CRC um, and South Australian Government embarked on an endeavour to, to work out what it was about our, uh, I guess about the traditional employment model that meant that autistic people couldn't contribute um, and to adjust that so that we, we could accommodate autistic people in our workforce. Um, so we modified recruitment. Um, We've taken away things like interviews and resumes. Um, we've put a whole lot of work into training. We've, uh, we've set up a three-week training program and the upshot is we now have 2% of our animal care workforce on the spectrum and it's been one of the best things as a business that we've ever done. And can you tell me a little bit, because uh, obviously as a business that'd be quite a challenging project to take on for existing employees. I imagine that there would be, uh, well, I don't know, was there resistance? Did, did people think, oh my God, what are we doing? Yeah, so um, I think the key in all of this is to remember that 
Whilst one to two percent, uh, sorry, two percent of our per workforce is now autistic, 98 percent of them are not autistic. And the important thing to recognise in programs like this is that that is the proportion of the workforce you need to really be accommodating. So we we spent a lot of time doing awareness. Um, we had a lot of barriers to overcome. We had people that point blank refused to work with people on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, by and large, this came from ignorance um, and including myself, my background is veterinary. Um, none of us had ever knowingly met anyone on the autism spectrum. So there was this great fear. It was like, well, what are they going to do in our workplace? Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be able to work as hard as everyone else? You know, this is a big challenge. We don't want to, we don't want to jump that hurdle. So we spent a good six months preparing our workforce um, doing autism awareness. We have a large Filipino contingent in our workforce, so we also had to do some um, translational materials. We prepared Filipino language materials for our staff. Um, and that training is ongoing, that awareness is ongoing, because the thing about autistic people is there is nothing visually that would necessarily uh, let you know that someone is on the spectrum. So if you're not constantly aware that you have an autistic person in your workplace, you might forget to make those accommodations. Um, so we did spend a lot of time with our existing workforce in the awareness front. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been to the great benefit of everyone because fundamentally what it comes down to is being an empathetic, compassionate person. And if you can, if you can find those traits within yourself, then working with, there's nothing about autistic people that makes them difficult to work with. The challenge has always been the neuro, like the neurotypicals and our acceptance and accommodation of our autistic workforce. And would you say, I mean, obviously in no workplace does everybody love one another, obviously there are challenges, but would you say that, uh, that the majority, if there was trepidation at the start, has that turned around now? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I've never seen anything change a workplace like our autism program has, the pride in the business has jumped beyond anything anyone would ever ex have expected. Um, our workplace culture is so much more tolerant. Uh, people are so much more patient. They're accepting, they're flexible. It's, um, people are just stepping outside their own little box and thinking a bit more about other people and the benefits that's had to our wider business are, almost impossible to quantify. Mm -hmm. And if you guys are interested, if you haven't already seen it, there's a terrific landline segment, actually, that you can access online on this program, which I found really fascinating. Now, moving on to Troy, tell us about your business and, uh, and you know, and what, uh, what approaches you're taking in your organisation to uh, increase diversity, promote inclusion, all of those things. Thanks. So, so our business um, it operates across the three northern states of, of Australia, across about five and a half million hectares of land and 400,000 cattle. And then we've got um, a little bit of farming as well in Australia. And then in Indonesia, we've got a, a couple of feedlots and uh, some horticulture and, and farming in, in Indonesia. And our product goes um, you know, all over the world. For, for us in terms of you know, employment, um, diversity, we really have a, an informal policy of no barriers to anyone and we'll open the door for everyone and then it's really up to you know, the team to, you know, or the team member to walk through the door for, for opportunities but we do push people every so often and say, hey, you know, you're, you've got these skills or you've got this ability, we want you to apply for this job or we want to give you this extra responsibility. So there's a little bit of, you know, Stick and carrot for yeah. a better term, but <laughs> but you know for for me you know we've really focused hard on the best person gets the job and we train people as much as we can and that's led to just shy of fifty percent of our workforce is female. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that's led on to about a third of our su supervisors are, are female. Um, we have some indigenous employment programs um, and they're they're okay. We could do do better at that. We have retention challenges with those programs. Mm -hmm. But we also have some, some other diversity. So including our business in Indonesia, about 50% of our workforce is Muslim. 
Um, and then we, we have you know, quite a, a diverse array of, of other, other religions, Hindu and, and Buddhist and then Christian. And so for us, we have you know, challenges like uh, when Ramadan is on, we have, uh, you know, it's like having Christmas. So a big portion of, the popul- of the, our workforce wants to take leave and, and things like that. So you know, that diversity is, is really good for us. It, it stimulates lots of ideas, but it also um, helps us lift the bar on quality and quality assurance. There is n- no doubt that having a significant part of our workforce being female really helps with quality of production and better quality data, less machinery breakages. Like, you know, we, the business we used to joke about that you know, the ladies would call up and say, my truck's making a funny noise, and the guys would call up and say, my truck's on fire. Um, <laughs> you know, but it... Well, it no, uh, can I draw you out a bit? Like, yeah. What is it about women? What is it about having women that, that results in better quality work and people not setting their trucks alight? I mean, you know, ev- everyone's different, diverse, and I, and I hate to just package people in, in different groups because we've got some you know, guys that are really good on attention to detail and, and animal care. But you know, if you have to generalise, certainly for us, uh, female staff uh, in our team are, are really uh, good on animal care, mm-hmm. very good on uh, machinery maintenance. Um, you know, the, they, they get injured less. You know, if we look at our workplace health and safety statistics, you know, the guys have a disproportionate amount of injuries. Mm. Um, and so, so there's, you know, there's lots of little things that all, all flow, mm. flow from that. But you know, our, our workforce is quite physical. The jobs are, are pretty physically demanding. So we do have a balance and we have done a little bit of mechanisation of some tasks, um, particularly lifting to heavier heights because um, you know, to, to fit in with the, you know, the workforce that we have. But it's very minimal. And the religious, the ethnic and the religious diversity that you're talking about in your workplace, uh, do you find you have to manage cross currents or do you find that the workforce, just by being in proximity to one another, manages them, themselves? Look, they reasonably manage themselves. We don't really have any issues, but when we, you know, we, we look at some of the things that we do around community engagement and giving back to the community and the environment, the, you know, we, we see uh, some slight differences from the, you know, the business in Indonesia. The, the team there really like to support um, you know, less privileged and, uh, and people that, you know, with scholarships. Um, they're very big on giving food mm-hmm. as, a, as, a, you know, as, as a gift and, and things. So that there's, there's sort of differences in, in terms of some of the things that we do outside of work where, where some of our other you know, groups in the organisation really say, you know, we should be doing environment or, or we should be doing this. So we end up doing lots of things on a pretty diverse, diverse base. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. We certainly, certainly learn a lot from, uh, from each other and, uh, and it's, uh, it's great fun. Yeah, great. And now, the sky's a long way away from me, but anyway, there she is. Um, I want to widen out the lens now. We've, we've, uh, we've had a couple of really interesting case studies from a couple of businesses about how you can do things to... Uh, make your workplace more diverse. Uh, but Sky has uh, written a book, which now uh, is Whispers from the Bush, is that right? Yes. And has done uh, a lot of research about uh, the prevalence of sexual harassment, for example, in rural workforces and communities. So I fear our story is going to get a little less positive for a couple of minutes. So tell us about that. What, what did you discover through this research? Okay, so in... I suppose just it's relevant to say that I grew up in central western New South Wales um, and practised law as an employment relations and discrimination solicitor in Canberra. And then at the point in time when I had my first baby, I was um, at home on maternity leave and it was suggested to me that perhaps I might like to engage in some research. Um, And I thought about that and I thought, yes, perhaps I would like to do that. And so it was that I sat at my kitchen table and thought, what is it that I've experienced? What is it that if I could write what I know, what would I write about? And where is that gap in the literature? So I thought about the threads of my experience over time and I thought about some of those perplexing moments that I'd encountered as a female person, um, particularly formerly when I'd grown up in, in parts of the bush. And I realised that actually there wasn't anything in the literature that situated um, the experience of rural Australian women um, in the context of surviving uh, sexual harassment daily. So I embarked on a journey um, whereby I I put out a a virtual um, cooey call using social media and I um, invited women and employers, either male or female, to get in touch with me if they'd like to um, have a visit from me in the course of the project. And um, I was inundated with with people who wanted to talk about their experiences, both men and women. 
And so I, I travelled Australia, spoke to the people and discovered um, some fairly shocking statistics arising from those interviews. And there, there were more than 100 interviews in total, um, all very much in depth, um, you know, two or three hours sometimes um, spent talking with people about their experiences to really understand what it was that we were talking about. So I discovered that 73% of all of the women with whom I spoke had experienced se sexual harassment as a part of their daily working routine. Now, these women... Um, came from a, a variety of occupational types around Australia. Um, some were female miners, some worked on cattle stations as gillaroos, um, some worked in meatworks, um, some were vets, some were police officers and so on. But if you take the cohort as a whole, 73% of those women in that cohort had experienced sexual harassment in the course of that work. Now, if we took a cohort that was just purely agricultural out of that first cohort, we discovered that 93% of those people uh, experience sexual harassment in the course of daily working life. What is it that we're talking about? We're talking about a range of behaviours, um, and there, there is a spectrum of behaviours, ranging from unwanted sexual comments, and it's really important that I emphasise that we are talking unwanted and unwelcome sexualised comments and behaviours. We're not talking about um, consensual office romances or, you know, um, really lovely flirtation that happens out there in the natural course of, of life. It's not that. This is the stuff that's, that's really designed to, um, I guess, impress power upon another person that doesn't make them feel good, that makes them feel humiliated. So um, examples of the behaviour that we're talking about might be, and, and these are highly specifically rural examples um, that, that I discovered. Women, for example, um, going out on a stock route, um, having to camp overnight with, um, with men in the course of doing so, uh, many of whom she hadn't known for a long period of time. And I'm speaking of one particular story in this, in this moment when I'm reflecting on this. This person hadn't known these people because they were contractors, um, rolled out her swag, they rolled out theirs relatively nearby. Over the course of the night, um, out came a portable DVD player and the sounds of the pornographic um, DVD that was um, you know, watched by the, the male pack over here. So this woman was lying under the stars, this old female, with a group of men who she didn't know well, having to endure the sounds of the porno um, in the course of her work. Um, that was one example. Another example might be um, the example that actually opens whispers from the bush, which is um, a terrible scenario that played out for a 19-year-old female miner um, who was uh, the, the sole fly-in, fly-out um, member of her team who was female. She encountered um, a range of behaviour, starting from... You know, she, she didn't have access to a bathroom um, and it became particularly problematic once a month when she had her period. So she requested that she have access to a bathroom, but instead of um, the, the requested facilities being made available, she was given permission to use a Toyota to drive into a um, facility once a month um, so that she could, um, you know, attend to her period. So that meant that the whole male pack knew that she was cycling once a month and at what time. So um, that was embarrassing as a starting point. But then following on from that, when she returned, she came to understand that the, the blokes were pissing on her boots while she was gone. And so she'd enter the mines with that stench of urine and the, the male banter and, um, you know, horrendous um, commentary that would, um, you know, follow about how much she stank um, as a person you know, in the course of that. That person's um, journey culminated when she was raped in the course of her work, um, in the course of her um, time in the mining camp, and she's now unable to work. She has post-traumatic stress disorder, and her story opens the book because it actually does speak to the, the most extreme version of sexual harassment. But, but we're actually talking about something that's um, generally um, experienced as reams and reams of tiny pinpricks, so normalised that to call each moment would seem facetious. And that's, um, that's why sexual harassment goes underreported by 68% of, of women um, who, who think that it's actually far less uh, dangerous to simply grin and bear it, or as 
I was told to fit in or fuck off. Um, that's the, the mentality um, that prevails rather than speak to that. And I'll just quickly explain why that is. It's because 85% of the employers with whom I spoke tended to regard sexual harassment as something that's not particularly important in the context of the everyday to-do list. So it's not, um, for, for the people with whom I spoke at least, it was something that was regarded as an irritant and something that um, if, you know, you had to, to prioritise um, the, the daily, you know, essentials, it certainly wouldn't be something that people should be, um, you know, crash tackling with all their might. Um, and from the perspective of, of the blokes on the ground, I should also say that this issue of sexual harassment, we know that the literature says that it's one about power. We know that it's a, a quest for power in many ways. But what, we, what I found in the course of the, the Whispers from the Bush research is that it's actually more complex than that even. These um, cultural norms that are demonstrated to men um, over the generations really do have an impact um, on the way that masculinity as a bloke is performed today. So when you've got a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, 19-year-old bloke who's been observing, you know, grandfathers and uncles and fathers over time, um, speaking to women in a particular way or, you know, showing that there's a particular way of, of doing things that's in accordance with being a good top bloke, people are going to um, simply model um, on, those, on those role models, you know, model behaviour on, on what they've seen play out. And so we, we do need to think about sexual harassment um, from a very comprehensive and empathetic perspective. I don't think it's um, enough to, to be talking about blame and shame. I really don't think that's the, the way that we should be approaching the conversation. And before I sort of draw you out a little bit more, Scholar, on what, how we might better fix that or approach that, I'm just interested uh, to get a reactions from a couple of the other panelists. Is this does it surprise you? This oh. these findings does it surprise you? I'm I'm lost for words after Sky's, and that's just <laughs> terrible. That's just not acceptable. Like it, that's just terrible. I'd, um, I mean, you know, sexual harassment is in you know, out in in you know, society and workplace everywhere, not, well, not hiding away from that well, by and, any means, and, but... And, and I, if I can just mm. say to you, in the latest uh, Sex Discrimination Commissioner's National Inquiry, one of the greatest offenders actually was the media industry, just full disclosure, but anyway, as you, as you yeah. say. Um, so I'm certainly not, not, you know, not surprised that, it, that it's there. I mean, we know it's, no, it's in the industry and we have very strict policies in our company and we talk about it and, and, uh, and are very open about it. We have you know, male and female staff camping out Next to you know, next to each other. I, I hope that I get the DVD players out. That would be um, pretty uh, pretty disappointing and terminal for, for those. <laughs> but um, yeah, ninety three percent. I mean, that's just mm. un. Mm. Yeah, it's just not acceptable. It's, well, and you it's said you have you have pr procedures, obviously, to inform your staff about how to act properly. And yep. what about for receiving complaints and assessing yeah, complaints? Yeah, so, so I suppose our, our procedures are, are more than just policies. So we have, we run induction week each each year, where you know people starting at the start of the year, because our, our workforce is reasonably se seasonal, um, go through you know, a good induction, and that includes um, you know talks about all of these things but then during the year we have updates as well um, we have male and female contact officers we have um, in uh, uh, confidential and uh, counseling um, number that you can call to either report something or get some get some counseling if you need to and then we also have a you know very much a, quite a strict whistleblower or reporting uh -huh. um, mechanism internally um, and um, yeah but um, you know it's made me certainly skies you know, stats have made me sit mm. back and think about, mm. um, are we doing enough? Sets you back a bit. Yeah. Um, I suppose for me, what strikes me most is that I feel reluctant to even comment on it in this forum, which I guess goes to support everything that Sky is talking about. Um, Why do you feel reluctant? Because it hits home mm. for me, um, to the point where I'm getting teary. <laughs> um, it does happen. Um, mm. And I think it's under-acknowledged um, and definitely under-reported. And in your own uh, organisation... I cry at the drop of a hat, just right. to be I'm clear. Just, I'm just giving, giving a bit of moral support here. You should see me about here. our autistic employees. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the Landline show, it really is fantastic. So um, I guess for me, uh, what this all speaks to is, and from our perspective with our autistic employees, is that it comes back to empathy and compassion. And if you care, you don't do these things. 
for, for men, you are fathers, you are brothers, you will have children, you know, you'll have little girls one day who will go and get jobs. Um, you might equally have a child who's on the spectrum, you might have a child who is blind, who is deaf. You want those children to have opportunities, you want people to accept them for who they are, and you don't ever want to think about someone you care about being bullied or penalised just because of who they are. Beautifully said. Thank you. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> you right? yeah. Okay. Um, Sky, let's let's pick ourselves off, off up off the mat here slightly. How do we improve this? Well, Kirsty's nailed it. In fact, um, I think that um, if we can't come from a place of empathy and consider for a moment the perspectives of the key stakeholders um, within the workplace. Um, in fact, I, I've broken it down in Whispers from the Bush in particular to, to three key stakeholders. We've got women, we've got men, and we've got employers. So from the perspective of, of women, um, in fact, I might, I might start with the perspective of men. If we think really carefully about sexual harassment from the perspective of men, um, as I said before, we've got a, a problem on our hands because we have a national narrative that celebrates a particular type of, of masculinity as, as being really good. Um, it's, it's the sort that's um, been passed down by the generations and, you know, as we know, um, it's entrenched by pop culture, for example, such as Crocodile Dundee or The Man from Snowy River and, and all sorts of um, beer commercials, which sort of, I guess, speak to um, a hard-earned thirst and sort of at the expense of, of the, the female's um, place within that space. So we've got this national narrative that sort of places and positions the female as other, and men are simply um, playing in accordance with what it is that we've set up as a country. And so I think we need to get really um, compassionate and empathetic about that. And we need to um, use that as our platform for changing that narrative. And changing the narrative means all getting very clear about things such as the really obvious things, like I said before, you know, what, what is sexual harassment and what isn't sexual harassment? Because the second question is, I, I've noticed, becoming um, all the more pertinent where men are tending towards not wanting to have conversations about sexual harassment because they're worried. They're really worried about um, whether or not what they said last week was okay or not okay. And there's a lot of confusion and we, do, we need to unpack that and we really do need to do that in a, in a particularly sensitive way given the, the cultural traditions that I've just mentioned. So there's this perspective piece on blokes that's um, really important. And then if you think about um, the sexual harassment issue from the perspective of employers, um, Troy's already been speaking to some of the fabulous things um, that are at play in, in his um, you know, leadership space, and that's fabulous. But for all of us as um, employers, we need to be thinking about what our duty of care means. What does it mean? Um, if we don't fulfil the duty of care, what are we liable for? That's a really pertinent question today because increasingly we're seeing um, big, big damages um, being paid out in sexual harassment matters where an employer has not taken all reasonable steps in accordance with the law to make sure that sexual harassment is not part of the cultural landscape. But that message for employers in the bush in particular, um, because of the nature of the, of the everyday pressures, it's, it's been lost in translation. Somewhere between parliament and our shearing sheds, we've lost the, the um, practical application of law. We've, we've lost, we, we have good law, but it's not really working on the ground. So we've got a lot of work to do to help employers and managers understand what that obligation and what that responsibility is all about. And then finally, for women, um, yes, we need to develop our collective capacity to really understand what sort of a standard we're entitled to. But beyond that, women, um, uh, we, we are doing ourselves a disservice on one level because 68% of women were using um, language that actively blamed other women for their experience of sexual harassment in the workplace. And the reason for that is um, quite frequently that it's easier to actually um, take the path of least resistance. It can be easier to actually join um, the, the you know, majority that's saying, um, look at that person and the way that she dresses in the shearing sheds, what a hussy or what a slut. It's easier to actually join that banter rather than 
being the person to, to actively challenge. And in actively challenging, we need to be comfortable with just having very simple conversations, such that if we do see um, someone being humiliated, um, and this can apply for men and women, if any of us see someone who, who is bordering, um, in our opinion, on, on looking as though they are not enjoying something that's happening, we just need to be um, asking questions like, sorry, can you, can you explain what you just meant? Because I don't think I understood. Um, sorry, can you, can you just unpack that for me? Or perhaps I didn't even hear you. Perhaps that's just the, the more easy way of approaching it. Sorry, I mustn't have heard you correctly because um, I thought you said. And then if it turns out that that person then, you know, expresses it again, we do need to be um, brave and we need to... In fact, I withdraw that. We don't need to be brave. We need to renormalise, actually, that um, it's not brave to, to have the conversation that, that points to behaviour as being substandard, we need to make that the norm, not just the, the exception to the norm that requires courage. That needs to be our new norm so that the collective narrative um, is holistically different. Sounds like a good idea. Now, um, yeah. questions, you guys. What questions might there be? Yep, many hands up. I don't know if <coughs> microphones come out. Is that it? Yep, beauty. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name's Renata Poliskas. I'm a cattle producer from over at the Lakes in WA. I've just got a question of, or more a comment, really. Um, I am, I've been in the meat industry all my life, in the meat and livestock industry, and it's something that I've really loved. It's fair to say that there have been a few flies in the ointment that have been a bit painful to deal with in terms of males. But I think I need to say that the majority of males that I have um, dealt with have been absolutely fantastic and respectful um, of what I've been trying to achieve and really encouraging. So what I'm actually trying to say, and I don't want to take away from what Sky has been saying, but I think it's important to note that there are some pretty absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. men in our production sector, in our agricultural sector, mm -hmm. and I think it is just, it's just really important for us to applaud yep them and applaud their behaviour because I think while there are a few flies in the ointment, I really don't, don't want to lose perspective mm. and I think we just really need to take off our hats to all of the, all of the brilliant men that, that have helped women. Thank you for the comment. Um, I, think it's, I think it is implicit on this panel that that's, that mm. that's the case. I think that we would, we would say that implicitly but thank you for the comment. Who else? Um, just, just quickly on that one, I was actually going to make that note that by far... Um, the good people I have worked with outweigh the bad people by thousands to ones. So I totally yeah. agree with that. The other thing I would just add in response to Sky's last set of comments is I think it's really important that employers don't shy away from employing people that are different, <laughs> and I include women in that, um, just because it's easier, um, because I think there's so much benefit to diversity in the workplace, it far and it, it outweighs any potential negatives and I think it's what's being drawn attention to today is just the um, the fact that everyone needs to be aware and it needs to be okay to pull people up if they're not doing the right thing um, and that we all need to support each other whoever we are. Who else? Yep. Hands up everywhere. Hi. Hello. Hello, Meshlin Khoury from Bayer. Thank you very much. It's an extraordinary discussion to be having and I thank you for that. Um, my question is to Kirsty and the focus on autism. Um, at Bayer, we are looking at our um, approach to diversity and inclusion. Um, we do it all the time, but we've got a particular focus on it at the moment. And I'm wondering how you came to land on autism specifically as an area that you wanted to be inclusive of and to bring more people into your organisation. What was the catalyst for that? So we have a very unique situation. Our, um, our CEO, Robert Van Barneveld, um, so he's the CEO of Sumpook, um, is also the CEO of the Autism CRC. He has a daughter who is on the spectrum. Um, so he's been a very strong advocate of autism for the last 20 years. And I guess he had a light bulb moment in 2016 where he's sitting there going, well, we struggle to get employees at Sumpook. And I know, so in the autism sector, um, the employment rate is around 42% for people on the spectrum. For people 
otherwise um, with disabilities, it's around 53%. For people without disabilities, it's 83%. So you're looking at half the employment rate for people on the spectrum. Where they are employed, they're generally underemployed, so they're underutilising their skills or education. So you can have very highly qualified and skilled people working in very menial jobs. Um, so for him, it was a coming together of a need and an, and an opportunity. Um, and our autistic employees are employed on the same basis as everyone else in our workforce. They are paid the same pay, they have the same um, entitlement. So it's not a charitable scheme. Um, and that's really important for everyone to realise. We are not doing this um, to gain any sort of street cred. We're doing it because our autistic employees genuinely bring something to our workforce. They're not our best employees. They're by far not our worst employees. They are just great employees. Some of the benefits they bring, though, are things like um, retention rates are high. They really like structure and um, predictability. So they've got this job, and for them, the best thing for them is to come to that job every day because it gives a structure to their life. And um, we can see that some of these guys will still be doing that job in 50 years' time. Sadly, I've got a ping of the bell there, so this, is, this will have to be the last question. I'm sorry, the lady in blue, I think, if there's a mic for her. Have to be the last one. We'll have to be quick on the question and quick on the answers. Sorry, guys. I'm um, sorry, um, this is an extension of the previous question. Um, I'm really interested in how you're codifying and really making this a program that could be replicable. Um, so what type of corporate partnerships that you've been thinking about, type of interactions with NDIS and other agencies as well, just because I feel like it's a little bottle of gold that we should capture? Um, so to speak to NDIS, we've really struggled with NDIS. In fact, it's worked to some of our employees' disadvantage um, for them to have a job because they are seen to be more able and less, um, and as a consequence, less requiring of support. So that's a bit of a catch that we're trying to overcome. Um, but in terms of corporate partnerships, at the moment, it, the IP rests with the Autism CRC. Um, and we are in a process now of translating our pilot program, which was very labour and cost intensive, into something that could be replicated by, uh, I guess our grand picture is that we would have a, um, a training and onboarding program where we might have um, eggs, uh, feedlot, piggeries. Um, we've had some interest from hydroponic um, tomato, capsicum growers, that kind of thing. Anywhere where you have a, a sort of a repeatable job um, that, you, that you need skilled labour to do, there's a, there's a spot for an autistic person there. Um, so we're setting that program up to be um, basically pick up, put down. Um, from an employer perspective, you just need to make sure you've got the local resources in place to support that program. Um, so within your own staff and then community services um, around independent living and, you know, learning to drive, all those kinds of things that, if you think of your 17-year-old um, school leaver, those kinds of skills that people need to transition into the workforce. Please join me in thanking our panel. Thank and thank you, too, for those questions. That was terrific. Well, that was an interesting panel, wasn't it? My goodness me. Um, it's really lovely to have the opportunity to listen to people that are proven leaders in their fields and to really have had first-hand experience in employing people that are different to us, having diversity programs within their organisations uh, and hear about some of the benefits that are happening from that. So we heard about um, diversity in leadership with disabilities, culture and religion and then also those fairly frightening st statistics from Sky. Um, one of the things that I was really interested in, we heard from Susan earlier with regards to the horticulture saying you have, she has trouble getting um, employers and then one of the benefits of employing people with autism is that they actually like that structure, that like that repeatability. So there's definitely a little conversation I think that needs to happen in that space. 
We must allow for differences in our workplaces and I think we shouldn't be frightened of things that are different to us. I, um, if I could challenge you all to go home and have a think about something that you could do that might be a little outside your comfort zone but what that could yield. And I think with regards to what Sky said, we need to not only have policies in place within our workplaces, but also behaviour culture change programs like CPC have got where they're actually addressing it constantly and it becomes a part of the conversation that's not quite so scary. We need to change behaviour together. I don't think it's up to men or women, but as hum up to humanity as, as a whole. I think it's really important that we support each other through the diversity that we need to, in order to take our industries forward. And I would encourage everyone upon listening to that panel session to reflect on what it is that you guys have as policies in your own companies or on your own farms um, and how you could potentially, maybe maybe you've got something that's rocking and that's awesome. Maybe you'd like to share that with somebody or maybe there's room for improvements and I'd encourage you all to have those conversations. So please join me once more in thanking Catherine and the panel. <laughs>